You're listening to The Jackie Daly Show. Perhaps the most hotly contested issue in the energy and environment arena is fracking or hydraulic fracturing. This is the process for extracting oil and gas from shale rock thousands of feet beneath the Earth's surface by injecting, first and foremost, water, sand, and then trace amounts of common chemicals. Fracking proponents point out that fracking is the key to the U.S. energy boom. Without it, we are not the number one natural gas producer on Earth, and we cannot move into the number one production slot in oil either. But opponents argue that fracking presents a threat to the environment. Officials in Obama's EPA, however, have pointed out that there is no known instance of fracking contaminating groundwater, which is the chief complaint, and state authorities have repeatedly vouched that their studies show that fracking is safe. Well, when there's disagreement, these controversies sometimes turn into political action and activism, and Exhibit A is Denton, Texas, right here in the Barnett Shale Formation in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, where the residents voted to pass a ban on hydraulic fracturing or fracking within the city limits. And immediately, lawsuits were filed by individual landowners and industry associations arguing that a city does not have the authority to ban fracking because it would render the property that the landowners own, the mineral rights, worthless and would also harm the greater Texas economy. Therefore, they argue it's a state issue and the city cannot ban the practice. And, and by the way, the regulation of fracking is really a state issue across the country. You've seen the state of New York move to have a moratorium. Colorado is considering voting on a ban statewide. California is now looking at it. So each state has a different situation, and each state gets to decide its policy. All right. Will the citizens of Denton, Texas, continue to be able to frack ultimately? How is this going to come out in the courts? We know the legislature in Texas have basically introduced several bills to address this, and they will have a say. They will try to define policy here. So we'll see, at least by the end of the legislative session, what they come up with. That's the end of May. Know this. It's not just a Denton issue, not just a Texas issue. This is all over the country. Both activists and the industry leadership are watching closely what will happen with Denton. You might remember I did five shows there last year leading up to the vote uh, for the ban, And you might also remember that the pro-fracking side outspent the other side 10 to 1 and yet lost the vote by 18 percentage points. So it seems that uh, even here in the heart of Texas, we've met with some resistance. And this seems strange since the great majority of the state benefits so dramatically from the production. Our argument is that education is needed. We're being joined today by Commissioner Christy Craddock. She is at the very top of the agency right here in Texas that regulates hydraulic fracturing or fracking. That is the Texas Railroad Commission. And she's got a lot on her shoulders because this is the energy capital of the United States. And she has to make sure that this state keeps up its unparalleled success that it has seen because of the shale boom. So, Commissioner Craddock, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Delight to have you. And We want to just start with some fracking fundamentals. Why is fracking important to the state of Texas? Well, I've always said that what starts in Texas changes the world, and fracking started in Texas 60 years ago. So this is not new technology. It's new improved technology, which is great for what is going on in this country. Fracking really is a well completion technique that uses water, sand, and less chemicals really than are probably under your kitchen sink today to break up um, the rock or the shale down in the ground. And so we read about fracking and nobody really understands it. The bottom line is we've been doing it for 60 years and Texas has done it for a long time. So we love being the leader. There have been about a million wells fracked in this country. So this is not just horizontal drilling, although again, Horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing started in Texas. We're glad to be a start of both of them. And a gentleman um, named George P. Mitchell, who is a was a leader in this state for a long time, developed the Woodlands down by Houston, Texas, some people might know. Yep. Um, he spent 
millions of his own dollars in 17 years up in the Barnett Shale, up in the Metroplex, up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area in Texas, and figured out how to merge hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling and break up shale. And so that technology started up in the Barnett Shale, started up in um, the Texas area, and has gone all over the country and and is really becoming a game changer for us in the United States. So the technology, is I call it the new improved technology, and what it's allowed us in Texas at least to do is now produce back to our numbers where we were in 1986, 2.43 million barrels of oil a day and about 20 BCF of natural gas a day. So we are now back in the conversation for the first time, really in a lot of people's lifetimes, mine included, that OPEC doesn't really control the price of oil again. We are we as a country and Texas being the leader are back in the conversation and that's an exciting piece of this technology. That really is because as you know, as we as all my listeners know, this may be the first time in our lifetimes that you see so much turbulence in the Middle East and elsewhere and yet look at the gasoline prices. We see that we benefit tremendously uh, from American oil from right here in our you know, in, in our land and with our workers producing it. So what is the impact of the industry, uh, you know, fracking, undergirding it in terms of jobs and GDP for Texas? You know, it's amazing what the oil and gas industry does for Texas anyway. It's a now about 34 to 35 percent of the economy in Texas is oil and gas again. Uh, it contributed this last year in 2013, we don't have 14 numbers, so the last 2013 number is about $13 billion with a B dollars to the state's economy. And everybody kind of hears about rainy day fund. If you live in Texas, you hear that the legislature is going to use rainy day fund. That's severance taxes. It's oil and gas production taxes that go into that rainy day fund that are allowing this state to by vote of the people to use some of those dollars to go to, to water infrastructure, or to transportation infrastructure. So important dollars going into this state that really are keeping us afloat and keeping us not just more than just afloat, but really keeping us at the forefront of the economy. And we are not having, thankfully, the challenges that we've had in the, in, in the, in this state before and really in the rest of the country. So Oil and gas is an important piece, but even more so, I think, than dollar-wise, it's also the salaries that people are getting. So the average salary in the oil and gas industry is averaging at $120,000 a year. Wow. That's real dollars for people. Now, not every job. I, I get that when I talk to oil and gas people, they'll look at me and go, we're not making that. But the average salary, I mean, if you're a truck driver in the industry, you're making probably six figures. Mm -hmm. These are real dollars in people's pockets that then they have dollars available to them to use um, to, you know, for to buy that are fungible dollars that the economy keeps the economy strong. Right. Well, and with all this in mind, and, and as familiar as Texans are with the industry, it came as a bit of a shock to some of us up here in Dallas, Fort Worth, um, that last fall, somehow, the anti-fracking movement managed to pass the ban on hydraulic fracturing in Denton, Texas, which made world news. I did five shows on it leading up to the vote uh, to try to educate people on what fracking was and what the research showed about it. That is all being challenged, of course, in court. And I know that the uh, legislature is going to address that this year. Uh, my question would be this. Given that people here know the benefits, uh, I know... You know, you said at the NAEP last year, because I was there for the kickoff address, that we have to communicate better. You know, industry and people who work in this industry have to communicate better what fracking is and, and why we should support it. What do you think has happened there? Why do you think Denton, Texas was able to pass that ban? What's missing? You know, I, I really do think it's a communication challenge for an education process. People don't understand, one, that fracking is a well completion technique. It's not how we drill wells every place in, in the state and in the country. It really is a well completion technique. It's one technique. And so in, in defined multiple ways, by the way, when it's a catch-all term, so I think there's a, I think Denton really got has a challenge, as do a lot of people if you're in the middle of the metroplex. 
being concerned about noise, about pollution, about trucks, and all valid all valid concerns with an industry going on, but I think they chose to ban fracking with a lot of misinformation. Yes. I'm not understanding that that really wasn't what they could should be doing. Hopefully, but they did have a vote of the people, and um, and I think the op- the opportunity really for cities and state leaders to try to work together to one explain from my from our perspective at the Royal Commission to explain. We are out inspecting. We do have very stringent rules in place about how you can drill a well, that we do protect the water source. By the way, there is not one well in this state where fracking has caused water pollution. Right. Not one. Right. Yes. And so, and as those are facts. We're a very fact-based agency. We have right. engineers. We have geologists. We, we have cases based on facts. That's very important to us as an agency. And so... You know, I think that that message still needs to continue being being out there, and people just need to understand. I think it's easier to have fear of fracking is causing causing a problem with your neighbor than um, the real facts. And also, and I and I say this to industry as well. I think there is a, a social license to operate for industry that they really need to be working within communities and educating communities, whether it's leadership or the person down the road from them, that what they're doing, how they're going to drill a well, what the process is. And one of the things we are trying to do to that end at the at the Railroad Commission is we've taken dollars we had available to us as an agency uh, in trying to update our IT, our, our website, our mapping system, because we, we have tons of information and we want want to be more efficient but we also think that information is out there publicly it's available we want to be more transparent and have that information whether it's what what the well who owns the well down the road from you or what's going where the pipeline is that right. you think is next door to you right. we want that information to be readily available to the public so i think it's a combination of misinformation and misunderstanding potentially from the city of Denton as well as our community people in those communities, as well as a challenge that all of us, whether it's agencies and or industry need to get out and continue to talk to people about what goes on in this industry. Well, your agency is bar none the best when it comes to being proactive about communicating, at least in my personal experience, because I communicate regularly with Texas agencies and I try to push out the good information, for example, that TCEQ has on air monitoring up near the Denton area or, um, you know, rebutting information about cancer clusters and things like that from the state health uh, agency. And, you know, what I find is anytime I speak to a commissioner at the Railroad Commission, I've had, you know, Commissioner Sitton on the show before he was a commissioner, but he's certainly open now. Uh, now you and uh, Mr. Porter has been very open. Everyone at, at your agency is very open. I have not found that with other agencies. And, you know, they'll direct me to a website or a report, but they don't want to come on the show. They don't want to give me quotes. They don't want to make statements. And I think that uh, after Denton, may- maybe we'll see a change in that because it's so important and the information is so good. There's nothing to, to, be- to hide from, uh, as far as I can tell, from what you all have. And so you guys do a great job. But but let me go back to um, your statements at the NAEP because it, they, it really left an impression on me. You basically said, you know, we have to be rethinking at the leadership level our attitude on communicating because traditionally um, oil and gas companies produce energy and create jobs. They don't necessarily do public relations per se. It's not really a core function. Um, have you seen any change in and I guess the approach by industry uh, since you've made that that speech. Well, one, I want to say thank you for the compliment to our agency because we, we try and we've just updated our media policy again to make sure we're as responsive as people would like for us to be. So that's our job, I think. Right. Uh, and the answer to your second question, slow. I think industry knows that they should be communicating, and I think they do, but not in one voice. One company will be out there doing it. Um, But the challenge you've got, and I have it as a regulator, is if you say something that you think is pro-industry, then 
everybody beats up on you as the regulator. If you say something anti-industry, then industry comes and beats up on you. So right, right. the industry's got a real challenge perception-wise to overcome, and I uh, and I think that it's it's slowly happening. They all talk that they know they need to do more of that. And I do believe individual companies do go in, have conversations with leadership, but I don't know that we've seen a huge movement to do that yet. And and that's what I'd love to continue to see happening because I think there's a good story to be told and we appreciate you trying to get the good information out there in the facts too. Um, but I think industry is, has just not historically done that and they're trying to figure out how to do it better. Right. Well, and who knows what lies ahead, because as we know, other states are taking negative action. Uh, You know, you saw what happened in New York. They put the moratorium on. Colorado came dangerously close to voting on a statewide ban. California has really been restrictive, and I think we'll see more. What's going to happen in Texas now after Denton? I mean, do you expect to see or have you heard of activists considering bans in other parts of the state? Uh, we have we we have been um, com- contacted a couple of times from other city leaders about bans and and I do think that there's some concern by other city leaders. One, they're beginning to understand what we do as an agency, which is good. We want to make sure that they do that. We're out there inspecting. If they have their own inspectors, we have relationships with inspectors in cities all over the state. So we want to make sure that they understand what we do. We go out and inspect in some cities together. And we'd be glad to do that. That's part of this isn't an adversarial role that we sit in as a state agency. We want to work with cities. Um, So we're seeing cities begin. Certain cities were looking at it anyway before Denton. Uh, There are a few that are looking at it as well. But I think uh, that you'll see the legislature potentially do something. A few of them have filed bills. A few members have filed some bills. And there's a lot of conversation between cities and oil and gas industry and this agency, because I I think the overall philosophy in the state is to work together, to be friendly to oil and gas, and how do we address some of the the problems that people are concerned about without going too far and banning fracking. And plus, I think the city of Denton may be realizing they've got a cost to their city, whether it's a business cost, whether it's lawsuit legal costs for them because there are now two lawsuits that have been filed against the city. So some, and I, so some cities have slowed down because of that, and some cities are continuing but are modifying some of their proposed ordinances more to be in line with what's reason, what I believe might be reasonable, which is reasonable setbacks, wanting additional information, which, by the way, we have as an agency, so they just don't know to come ask for it or, or get it from us. So we're continuing to, to reach out as an agency to try to make sure we're available to cities if they want to visit with us and see what we do and, and how we can work with them and, and help them in their process as well. Well, that, I think, is going to be maybe the key because right now, if you read even the mainstream press and some of these less credible documentaries and things. They say over and over again that this is an unregulated industry. It's just so wrong because you all have volumes and volumes and volumes, probably thousands of pages of regulations governing the process. What is your reaction when people say this is an unregulated industry? What in the, what, how in the world do you react? Well, it always surprises me, but one, our name doesn't make a lot of sense, so they may not know how to <laughs> yeah. find us sometimes. That's, that's um, true. The real- that is true. But the reality is, for Texas at least, the Railroad Commission has been regulating production of oil and gas since the 1920s, 1930s. This is not new. We're probably the most respected agency, I think, in the world, but definitely in the country for oil and gas. And we have had, for instance, casing rules, how you case a well, how you protect the water water source as you're drilling down. We've had rules in place for 60 years in this agency. We think, and, and we've just redone them about a year and a half ago. We now have, we think, the best practice rule in the country. So we've been doing this a long time, and, 
And sometimes we've just done it and people don't realize it. Um, but we are out pipeline, do we do pipeline safety inspections very regularly? That's why I think that we have fewer problems if people realize that we really are out inspecting, that we do have rules. And that if we didn't, you'd see a lot of other issues in the state. And when you explain to them that we do have inspectors, we go out, that there are rules, uh, they go, oh, really? You know, very kind of a surprise thing. So we might be the best, the best kept secret in the state, but also the most important secret in the state. If not, I don't think we would have as vibrant an oil and gas industry in the state if we didn't have fair, consistent regulations that people know what the rules are who are operating in this industry and people can go find the answers. And if you've got a problem, you pick up the phone, you call us. If it's if we feel like there could be a challenge with one of our rules or we think it's appropriate, we're going to go out and inspect and, and work, one, with operators to get them in compliance. But, two, we enforce our rules. And we enforce it both with penalties and making them clean up or, or adjust the, and get in compliance. If not, our ultimate tool in the state we don't use it often, but we use it when necessary, is really to sever a well, meaning that that well can no longer produce. And that producer, that operator who spent millions of dollars on that well, no longer can operate that well until they get in compliance with us. So well, that's a pretty, I think that's a pretty harsh penalty at the end of the day if we have to use it. Well, and what's interesting is that a lot of people in the industry will say, we want that regulation because we can't afford for one of our number to do anything silly or, uh, you know, to be polluting, because that's going to harm us all. If something, if something bad happens and there's an incident, and it's widely reported, that is going to have blowback onto the whole industry, which I thought was an interesting point uh, to make. And so they rely on you all to make sure that, that in fact, that happens. You're really protecting, you know, the, the continued forward motion of everyone who's out there investing their fortunes into trying to produce energy for the country. And so we are thankful for that. So I have kept you quite a long time, and I thank you for being so generous with your time. Learned a lot, and you're always welcome to come back and chat with us in the future. Thank you. I'd love to call anytime. Thank you for having me today. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a great evening. You too.